Kia ora, talofa, magadangu manga, anyong, and namaste. As soon as I figure out and prove that I'm a slave to this technology, I will uh, find out how to close this and open up my presentation. And if there's a tech person somewhere, that would probably speed things along because I'm not very good with these touch boards. I'm delighted to, I will, I will let you do that if you don't mind. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. I want to acknowledge all the people here that I know and work with and am associated with over time. It's wonderful to see you here. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the people that I don't know and haven't met that are here. Uh, it takes very great courage to, to walk in the door of an event like this uh, if, uh, if it's not a familiar space to you. So I want to acknowledge that this is, um, that this is a risk that, that you are taking, and I want to thank you for being here. There are a lot of people who have worked on these issues for many decades uh, who are here and seated around the room. And there are some of you for whom this is an entirely new experience. And I think that's wonderful. And I salute you for being willing to be here today so that we can move beyond all of that. Uh, in some ways, anything that I would say today is, at this point, is quite possibly redundant because we've had some outstanding speakers who have raised many of these issues already. Um, but perhaps there are one or two ideas that, that I might present to you that you can then take to lunch. And I am mindful that lunch is next. Um, we, we certainly know what the problems are, um, that, that we've heard those documented, we've heard the issues, we've heard, we've heard f very clearly what's, what many of these issues are, um, but, but frequently we focus only on our problems. Now, in some ways, the political and funding structure in which we work encourages the problematizing of identity because we don't get funding, we don't get support, we don't get resources unless we can prove there's a problem. So we have to to say, well, I've suffered more and I've suffered more and gosh, there's more, there's more horror going on over here and there's just terrible things happening here and so we need resources and that's the way we get those resources. But we've also heard that there's a tremendous amount of strength within our communities and my task today is to focus on those, on those kinds of strengths, that we are resilient, resourceful, talented, capable people that do very well. And that is not to deny that there are some challenges and some very serious issues that we are facing, but we have the resourcing within ourselves to meet some of those needs. As you've heard many times, and each speaker has dealt with this issue, and I'm going to do it too because I have an opinion about it, but I'm not dogmatic about it. Language is fraught, and I choose to use sexual and gender minorities, not because I say, oh, I'm a sexual or gender minority. You can identify yourself however you want, and I celebrate that, but we need to talk about collectives and groups of people. Um, we obviously cannot use um, heteros not heterosexual, that's completely inappropriate. Um, I've, some people don't like to use the word queer. I'm sorry, I just can't bear the, I know I'm walking against the wind here, but I cannot identify myself as a rainbow person. I just can't do that. I am more of a storm cloud that produces the rainbows. <laughs> and, and, and we have all this LGB, all this, I am not an acronym. And, I'm, and we need to find a way to talk about ourselves where people don't stumble over it or get terrified that they're going to leave out a letter and somebody's going to get offended and jump up and down at them. So we need to find a better way to do that. And I think the collective, um, for the moment at least, is sexual and gender minorities. And of course, we know that there are many things that divide us. Language is one of those things. And we've got a whole lot of different kinds of ways to refer to sexual and gender minorities throughout the world. And I've just thrown a few up here that you might be familiar with. And I don't want for a second to suggest that these are equivalent terms to gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc., because of course they're not, but they are ways of identifying sexual and gender minorities in different cultures and communities around the world. And that's one of the things that divides us, is that we are so different. And that's one of the challenges that we find together. But there are some things that unite us. This photo was taken off a bus stop, um, not, not far from where I live. Um, the things that unite us, that we can come together on, are things like oppression, are things like social exclusion, 
and things like, oh, and here I'm going to use a very big word, epistemological frameworks, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But what I do mean by that is worldviews, how to be a simple way to understand, or how we know what it is that we know. I believe that there is such a thing as a queer epistemology, a queer way of looking at the world and understanding the world, and it's focused on two basic principles. The first is alienation that we have an experience of ourselves as different. And the second is disclosure, that we have to announce ourselves in some way. And those two things are mediators of a queer epistemological framework which shape the way sexual and gender minorities live in and understand and interpret the world. That's the way we process information, and it's also the way we create coherent communities. Those experiences, of alien, those experiences are fundamental to who we are, and for those members of sexual and gender minority communities in the room, it may be the only thing that we share in common, other than oppression and exclusion. Well, when I say alienation, what we need to be aware of is that we are surrounded in our lives by opposite sex attraction images, heteronormative images that just fill our lives and, and tell us and teach us what's normal. And we have to separate ourselves from that. First of all, we don't feel like we belong to those things. We have to reinterpret ourselves, reinterpret those images in order to feel like they, they're, that, that we're a, a part of that in any way. That telecom ad with the grandfather and the tear down in the eye, the Fiji advert you know, of, the, of, a, of the happy couple frolicking on the beach with the very dark pilot that's wrong on so many levels. Um, <laughs> and we have to reinterpret that image to see if we actually if that's meant for us. Is that a safe place for us to belong to? And we have to assess that because that's, that's what we automatically do and most of us don't even know that we do that constantly. We're always assessing that environment. We don't feel like we belong. And the second thing that we need to do with all of this, well, here's what we, here's what we do all the time. <laughs> we are continually having to reinterpret the world as a part of all of that. And we develop, and, and the second thing is disclosure. And we have to announce ourselves in some way. We have to disclose ourselves as not being part of the heterosexual majority. And we have to do that in some way. I did that by giving Michael a kiss on my way up here. And it's like, don't die wondering, folks. Here I am. Um, <laughs> with, you know, and, and being that way a long time. Um, we, and we develop this epistemology because of heteronormativity. Because we live in a world where heterosexuality is the predominant paradigm, it's the predominant, it's, it's what exists out there that we can, are, can, that is continually reinforced by the images, by knowledges, by the way we live. And so that heterosexual identity is normative, which means most common, and therefore made normal, which is to say non-pathological, and anything else is not normal. So when we go out from here, how many, I, I, I hope that we don't go out here and have gay lunch, because we don't need to have gay lunch. We have lunch, because this is our space now. Get used to it. All right. Um, we, there's, there's a constant, there had, has been an historical debate about how, how sexual identities become to be. There is, there, there, and, and I think that, that the way we res resolve those issues, and I want to introduce you to, to uh, Philip Hammack, who's, a, who's an American psychologist, um, who has proposed an integrated life course perspective on the development of human sexuality. And he suggests that sexual orientation is in fact biologically based. And then this includes arousal, desire, and intimacy. But he differentiates orientation from identity. And what he says, and I love this expression, he says that individuals internalize the sexual story possibilities of a culture, the cultural presses, which are outside our individual control, but which we live in our lives. And those two things for, together, 
the, 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 the sexual orientation, desire, arousal, and intimacy, and the sexual s story possibilities somehow combine together in each of us to create it who it is that we are in our lives. Men and women follow different trajectories. They're quite different, and in my own research certainly supports that men's identities tend to be more fixed earlier in life, and women's identities tend to be more flexible and fluid, and I'm very jealous of that. Um, but, but interpersonal relationships are extremely important in forming sexual minority identities. And those identities can be quite fluid and across species too. Now we all know that the traditional stages of coming out, um, the, the pre-coming out, coming out, exploration, first relationships, uh, integration and synthesis, and it's important for us to remember that like the stages of grieving or like any other stage models, these are not necessarily linear, they are not proscriptive or prescriptive, they are simply ways to describe parts of, the, uh, parts of a process of differentiation. Now, these, pro these stages, in a sense, describe what I'm going to call this morning kairos time. They can occur at any chronological age of the individual. It doesn't matter when they start, but they are a process that individuals go through. They describe a kind of process that individuals go through in achieving that sense of differentiation and consolidation of identity. And they can occur at any age. Now, one of the questions that we need to ask, that has been raised certainly in the, in the literature, is are we in a post-gay environment? Is all this talk about, about identity really, really kind of silly and ridiculous? And is it, is it very dated? And is it very 80s and so last year? Um, well, and young people certainly seem to be pretty flexible and fluid about their identities. But others find that labels are, are still useful as, as a way of beginning to create an identity for themselves. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. But I would propose that until heteronormativity is completely eliminated, some process of differentiation, exploration, and identity reintegration will have to be achieved by individuals. So even though we may like to think of ourselves as post-gay, and I'm using that in inverted commas, please, the very fact that we have to identify ourselves as different means that we have to go through some kind of process to understand that difference. And so we're really not. Uh, I, I, I'd say it's, it's an irrelevant question as to whether or not we're in a post-gay environment we're in an environment where we still have to identify who it is that we are and how we are different. And that exists because of this heteronormative environment in which we find ourselves. And uh, heterosexuals have a lot to answer for, uh, in my view. Uh, and one of, the things that the, one of the things that they need to answer for is this, this sense of this experience of privilege that so many of them live, this unthinking, unconscious privilege that heterosexuals assume as of right by who they are and the way they were born. We, those of us who are gender and sexual minorities don't have that privilege and we have to struggle to re-achieve that privilege. Now I want to review very quickly um, the literature on the satisfaction, life satisfaction with identity because, that, because we're going to, all of this is going to come together in a few slides. Interpreting social and cultural environments is certainly a challenge. It's what I do as an academic, and I have no idea how to do it. Um, it's, it's just very complex. Even the legacy of the so-called gay liberation movement, if I can use that expression, is, is contended. Um, did, the, did all that political work that our forebears, our forefathers and foremothers and four people did for the, over the last 40 or 50 years simply create a kind of generational rift? Do people under the age of 25, maybe even 30 now, have any idea what it was that that generation went through in order to create who we are and to bring us into this room right now, which would have been unthinkable 50 years ago? Or did we just replace one cultural hegemony with another one? Which, it, which posits white Western middle-class values that essentially mimic heterosexual pathways. As, did we simply replace one hegemony with another? 
I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, and I realize that I'm glad you're not armed, I'm not sure what all this discussion about marriage is. I'm not sure I know what marriage is. Now, I know that I want the equality to do what, what heterosexuals do, but I don't think anybody can really talk about marriage w without fully understanding what that means. And I don't think that discussion's been had yet in any kind of coherent way, but we have this mythic kind of model about what that is, and we want some of that too. And we need to be a little more reflective about that, I think. Where do all of the other people who don't affiliate with mainstream gay, lesbian, and bi communities or cultures belong? And in it, so that in addition to challenging heteronormativity, which I have done just briefly, we also need, I think, to challenge homonormativity. That a set of values that we think we all share in common, but in fact don't because of all of those different ways that describe us. Homonormativity is the prevailing gay paradigm that's emerged over the last 40 years. And if we don't know who the latest singers are, if we don't wear the most fashionable clothes, if we don't, if we don't know what the greatest pop culture is, then somehow we've, they're going to revoke our gay license. And that's concerning. So we need to challenge the homonormative assumptions. The literature on general life satisfaction and happiness over the life course finds that for general populations, and this is when, when we say general, we mean predominantly heterosexual, but it's probably got some non-heterosexual, p-sexual and gender minorities in there as well. There is a U-shaped curve that starts out very happy with life in their 20s and that reaches the lowest level of satisfaction with their life at 52 years in the US, 46 years in Europe, go figure that out, and for general population women, 38 years in the US and 46 years in Europe. So that's when, that's when people are least satisfied with their lives. It may have to do with mortgages, I don't know. And then they get, and then they get happier at the end. So there's this, this U-shaped curve. This is age-defined cr or chronological age-dependent time. I've introduced the concept of kairos time, which is stages that can occur at any age. Chronos time occurs at a specific chronological age, right? So we've got those two, two understandings of time. In self-identified gay men, happiness, satisfaction with life, and self-esteem decrease during the first stages of coming out, that kairos time, and increase over the latter stages of coming out, when they're beginning to reassemble and reassimilate their identities. I'm afraid I searched really hard and found no similar studies for women, so there's some work here to be done. Women, if you, if you want to have some comparable data here, I really have looked for that, and there isn't any that I can find. We know that sexual minority use experience higher levels of many problems, and there, there is an author cover who challenges these notions and suggests that these behaviors might be related to other contributing factors rather than being caused by sexual minority status. What we do know, however, is that simply referring somebody to a community of like others, oh, you should go talk to such as this, this or that agency, is not a guarantee of successful identity development. Some, some, one study found that use referred to use support groups increased the likelihood that a young person would use alcohol, drugs, and increase their risky sexual behavior because they'd found a community of like others. And it's like, oh, I, f I found a home. And, and that increased their risk. What that implies is if your agency is not prepared to deal with sexual minority young, or gender minority young people, simply referring them to another agency may not be the answer. You've got some work to do as well. Now, sexual minority elders have both extra challenges and extra coping skills. We are not all bad, sad, and mad. Their coping skills that sexual minority elders have found is belonging to a community, creating families of choice, having strong connections, serving as positive role models, living an authentic self, honesty, personal insight, and a sense of self, increased empathy and compassion, 
I'm reading these off because it's worth, it's worth saying them for whatever posterity is going to hear this. Freedom from gender-specific roles, exploring sexuality relationships, egalitarian relationships, and ability to manage loss. Those are strengths that sexual minority elders have learned as a, as through, the, through the difficulties of living through the life course as a sexual gender minority elder. And I think that's an important piece. Now, this concept of resilience is fuzzy. There's no agreed definition of what resilience means. But it is, at least, a dynamic process that leads to positive adaptation in the context of, a, of, of adversity. Resilience includes good social support, self-acceptance, strong developmental support. And, and this has certainly been supported by the data that we've seen today. Following a particularly stressful adolescence, many GLB adults appear to make a rebound towards greater mental health and to achieve a level of psychological adjustment on par with heterosexual comparison groups, even though they continue to face unique stress factors. What it's saying is our young people are strong. And, we, and, and they use those strengths throughout the course of our lives, and we can do well with, with that. Now, the Lavender Island study that I did a few years ago uh, now um, studied 2,269 um, LGBs in New Zealand. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid I need to use that language because that's the language we used on this, at the study. And among and many, many other things, uh, we looked at milestone developmental ages. Um, what, at what age did you feel different? And at what age did you come out to yourself, not to others, but to yourself? And we asked mean satisfaction with sexual identity by age group and gender on a scale of one to seven, where one is low. And we, that's the number of people that answered the question. And milestone developmental ages, and those of you who work in child protection agencies need to take note of this. At what age did you feel different? The mean age, the mean age was 11.2 years in men and 14.3 years in women. That's the mean age. That means that our young people feel different quite early. And we need to be aware of that when we're doing child care, child protection, and, and foster care assessments and placements. At what age did you come out to yourself? 18.7 years in men, 23 years in women. Now, don't be frightened. This is a whole lot of data, but I just want to prove to you that there is data to support this slide. And this slide is the interesting one, and is the whole purpose I'm here, I think. This is satisfaction over the life course. Mean satisfaction on a scale of one to seven starts, there was nothing below five, and it, nothing above 6.4, whatever. <coughs> And these bottom lines here are age groups, under 20, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and so forth. If you notice, please, what happens is that in the community overall, and in men, and especially in women, identity satisfaction in LGB communities, individuals, increases over time. And in women, it never levels off. It just keeps going. <laughs> which is pretty cool. It stops there because that was the oldest person we talked to. Um, now, why it doesn't level off for women, that's a good question. Maybe they're just wildly satisfied with their lives, or maybe we didn't find people old enough to ask, and it might level off somewhere, I don't know. But the point is, it does get better. People are extreme, uh, sexual minorities are extremely satisfied with their lives once they get through those, the first difficult period. They draw on that resilience, and it works for them throughout their whole life course. We do well. Now, those of us who are more mature in years need to make sure that we pass on the, those lessons, that resilience, the, and support that resilience in the younger people coming through. But we have strengths. We have possibilities. We have, we have a vision of ourselves that are very satisfied with who we are. This is uh, one of the participants in the study who said, uh, it's been very hard. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It was a bad day at school with bullying, and the teachers let it happen. When I came out to my family, all except my mother wanted nothing to do with me, which continues today. You have to be strong to be gay. And that's the message, of course. We have to be strong to be sexual and gender minorities. 
and we, ha we are, is the message that the rest of the data are showing us. Now, <clears throat> what do we need to change? I've got an eye on the clock in your lunch. Sexual and gender identity is fluid and continues to evolve over time, and it's not merely linear. We need to remember that stages of development are kairos time. There, there are stages of development that occur at any time. We need to remember that we are strong and that it will indeed get better. Satisfaction with sexual minorities, in sexual minority identities increases over later stages of identity development. That's all well and good, but we can't and we shouldn't wait for it to get better. We have a right to, for it to be good now, and our, so do our young people. So what do we need to change? If alienation is part of a queer epistemic framework, then we need to be aware that sexual and gender minority clients will approach us as helping providers, caregivers, professionals from an experience of not belonging. They will assume that they are going to be rejected unless we specifically and explicitly find ways to include them. They will not trust us and they will and we will need to mediate and they will need to mediate everything we say through their own individuated experiences. If identity is fluid and disclosure, the need to tell somebody that you are not heterosexual is part of that framework, then we need to ensure that we don't approach, ap approach those relationships from a heteronormative or a homonormative position. We need to reassure them that identities are fluid and that, yes, it, it's uncomfortable for now, but it's also expectable and it's ordinary. That is, you're not crazy for feeling the way you do. That's part of how, how identities evolve over time. We need to normalize those experiences of discomfort and that it's not all gonna happen overnight. We need to move, of course, as you've heard other presenters here to say, we need to move from a passive response to an active preventive response. We should not have to wait until we get complaints about assaults and bullying, but instead be proactive about in our school systems and in other places. We need to enhance those contributors to resilience that we've seen. Child protection workers must keep sexual minority children and young people in mind in, in the work that they do. And all of us, every single one of us, needs to challenge cisgendered heteronormativity wherever it exists. And it exists in health and mental health systems, in education, social services, child protection, youth justice, prison and probation, domestic violence, immigration, which I haven't heard talked about today yet, um, aging and, other, and residential care facilities, in social policy, in workplaces, and everywhere else that we find it Im practically embedded in policy. We need also to challenge homonormativity and our own stereotypes about what constitutes an appropriate sexual or gender minority identity wherever those exist. And we've talked about that previously. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. I've, I've ripped through this very quickly. If you want a copy of, of, uh, of an article that, on which this was based, um, which is that piece, Identity Satisfaction Over the Life Course, please give me an email and I'll be happy to send you out a PDF and, uh, and that way uh, you can see a little more and in, in, in your own time some of this stuff that I've, that I've moved very quickly through. So I thank you for your attention. And we've got about five, five minutes for questions. So if there are any questions for Mark, over there. Um, just what's so, Stick with the mic. Oh, okay. What's cisgendered? Yeah. The opposite of transgendered. Oh. Okay, we don't need the mic. Yeah, you learned something. Yes. Take it to lunch. <laughs> any other? Um, yeah, I have a question about the about your comments about the marriage debate and uh, the marriage those were equality. unscripted. No, no, that, and that's that's good. That's good because I mean, what I, I'm 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 sort of thinking out loud here. And hmm. is is the the marriage equality debate that's going on not only in New Zealand but in in other um, places, particularly Western countries, 
um, a step in the discussion about heteronormativity and is this all about um, our communities saying that we do belong and, and, and are part of society? Is, is this just a, a stage in the discussion, do you think? Well, it sounds like what you think. <laughs> well, but I'm, I'm curious about what you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that, that, I, I have opinions. I have lots of opinions, and, and I want to be cautious about ex being, expressing my opinions about that are that are personal from from data supported things, but I think I think we are chipping away at equality and full belonging in as many ways as we can do that, and I think that's that's the one that's been chosen for us, and so that's what we're doing at the moment. Mm. But what I what I'm suggesting is that we need to be cautious about simply taking the mom and pop stereotype about this idealized concept of marriage and simply saying right that fits us nicely because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Is this, is this then a useful debate? What do you think? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think it is. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, yeah. You know, I'm just sort of curious, yeah. that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any political debate is a useful debate to some people. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got an, we've got another question here. Hey, uh, just a quick thing. Um, Obviously, you're an academic. So, do you teach some component of your course, <laughs> at, like that at Massey in, so. in social work? Do you teach a component of your course? Absolutely. About, yeah. Absolutely. So that's I didn't think there was going to be, but I've got some students in the room, and you, they can attest to that. Absolutely, I do. And is that delivered across other courses in healthcare as well? Uh, I get asked to do to get to do guest lectures in in places, particularly in nursing. So, yes, yes, okay. in, but not uh, not as much as we should. Not, not nearly as much as we should. And, and what I'm discovering about myself is that I'm really tired of teaching about sexuality as a culture. That what I'm now doing is teaching a lot, is doing a lot more challenging heteronormativity and calling people to task for their privilege um, and for, for uncritical privilege. I mean, they inherit it. They can't do anything about it. I'm not blaming people for it. But, but the, the people, we need to be more thoughtful about, about the privileges that we have. Because, I mean, obviously, people have this unintentional ignorance um, that they're not often aware of. There you go. So is there not often a, is not aware that that can be structured mainstream into the course as opposed to even having a separate section where it segregates itself? I'm sorry, can you hold the mic up? I I'm just... saying, um, is there not aware that this can be mainstreamed in the course as opposed to all, like already causing segregation by it being taught separately? Um, it, it's taught as part... I don't teach a separate yeah, paper okay. on being gay, no. Um, well, I what, what, I, what I teach. You do very well at teaching it. Well, maybe I'd like. To, well, I want to design the labs. Um, what, 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 what I do. What I do, however, is is fold this in to to to, to critical thinking about contemporary social issues and contemporary populations that we are likely to serve. Because I teach social work. I mean, that's what we do. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Hi, Mark. Can I just pass a comment on that last question? Um, the recent research that we undertook um, that resulted in the Let's Talk About Sex, Sexuality and Gender report, um, we interviewed, a, a, I can't remember now, close to 50 mental health professionals across a wide range of services, and 84% of those people that we spoke to said that they had never undertaken any form of mm. training around issues relating to sexual orientation and gender diversity. So yeah. I think in answer to your question is no, we don't have a um, well-organized um, no. e education no, no, program no. that should actually be right at that fundamental beginning of any um, health or oh, service-related training. I yeah. thought the question was about what I did, and I, because I didn't hear all of it. I'm sorry, and I expect No, I'm just taking the opportunity to get on a hobby horse. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. OK. You can have that one. <laughs> Are there any more? Probably got time for one more question before lunch, or oh, oh. I want to be provocative here to stimulate discussion over lunch. So please. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is really in your gamut or not, but um, a couple of years ago, I was at a, su a suicide symposium um, in another hotel uh, that was predominantly about middle-aged men and it, it, how so it, probably mid, it was pr predominantly about middle-aged men. Middle-aged men. I heard and, Malaysian, so it's good to clarify. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the risks that increase in, in that age group. And I was quite interested with your U-shaped thing there of 
life satisfaction and, and how that compares to, to gay men, and although it levels off less than gay women, but still there's, isn't, and I'm also mindful of the, one of the first questions we had earlier today about how are people coming out later in age, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about suicidality with older gay men vis-a-vis -vis the life satisfaction. It, it seems almost incomparable. Well, I, I don't know the data on it, I, I, and so I'm, I'm not competent to speak to that issue. Um, I, I think it, what, we've, what we certainly have seen today is that these are very complex issues and that there's not one triggering thing that, that but, but, but that said, what I'd want to look at is are we ta when we say middle age, are we talking about chronological time or chiratic time? which suggests that these men may be moving through their process and in fact are on that, that sort of downward slope of the, of, the, of the coming out process before they tip up. I don't know and we'd want to know more about that. At that. Um, and I think uh, now's the time we take the chance to break for lunch and say thank you again to you. Mark and all of our speakers this morning. It's been great. Thank you all.